Well, hello everyone and welcome to Political Paradigm. I'm Terry Ikumi. Now, we will turn our attention away today from the national politics and do some state politics, especially considering that we have off-season elections just around the corner. But today our attention turns to River State. My guest is a former APC governorship candidate in the state. My guest is Mr. Tony Cole. Welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you, Terry. How are you today? Well, I would have asked you that question. I'm fine. You by look the way. fine. <laughs> I'm fine, by the way. I would ask you that because you tend to appear very relaxed, and I wonder how you're able to stay positive despite all that's happening around you. You know, River State is an interesting place. It so happens that I think in politics, it's so different from everywhere else. And if you're going to make a difference, then you have to come with it in a totally different way. And so staying positive is critical to winning in River State. Um, I you know it's interesting for me because you've tried on two occasions to two be occasions. governor of River State. Mm -hmm. It's not gone your way. And on those two occasions, on the first time, it was a court decision. The second time, you were attacked. You felt that the process wasn't good. So I'm, I'm always looking out for how uh, politicians tend to manage situations like this when they don't go their way. Your case is quite peculiar. Mine is peculiar. You know, the, the, each time there are huge lessons to learn. And I think the first time around when I came in, um, there was such an internal division within the APC. It was tearing APC apart. And I came with this belief then uh, that what needed to be done uh, would be to bring all of these different uh, factions together, point out what the main goal is. And that, that main goal at the end of the day is to win and change uh, the paradigm of River State. I underestimated how bad that fight was. And at the end of the day, what it did was that it taught us a new lesson about um, what divisions can do within a party. So we ended up in court, and the court took us out. I think it was the first time that you would see a major political party in Nigeria taken out from top to bottom by the court. Uh, it was a big lesson. It was a humbling experience. Uh, we will talk about that <laughs> eventually. But, you know, when I speak with technocrats, they all tend to say the same thing, explaining why they would jump from um, the uh, entrepreneurship line to mainstream politics. And they say that we should stop leaving politics to career politicians. Was that the same for you? Because you, uh, you were a businessman. I believe you still are, even though you're now into mainstream politics. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it as leaving it to career politicians, and I think that's where the mistake really is. What we have to do is become politicians fully, because you cannot go half and half. I remember my father saying to me when I was thinking about this, and he said, you know, my father is an old politician, and he says, if you're going to do this, you cannot go with half foot in, half foot out. When you go in, go in 100% all the way. The reason being that there are people who spend their entire life in this field, and you're coming up against them. They know the tricks, they know every game that is to play. And we're seeing, we're learning that they know these games. And if you're going to beat them, then you must study them, you must know them, you must understand them, and you must find ways to defeat them, even at their own game. But what's your intention of joining for, for joining politics? You know, it's quite clear that you want to be governor of River State. There are politicians who make clear-cut uh, statement as to what their lifelong ambish, political ambitions are. Uh, for you, I don't know if it's the governorship uh, seat that it's your, that's your main target, but one, what's your motivating factor for joining politics and leaving the world of business? And two, is it your lifelong ambition to be governor of River State. <laughs> okay, so in the first one, I think that's easy enough. Um, for, for many years, I've been involved in what you would call the philanthropic arm of doing business. So you do business to do good. And I kind of believed for a long time that business had the kind of force that would more or less influence decisions in policies, in governments, and all of that. Now, I remember sitting down with a president, a former president of Nigeria, he was president then, and more or less challenging them that, look, how can you be here and we have all of this poverty, we have all of these things, what do we do? And business can do a lot. Now, he challenged me that day. Long story short, he said to me that if you really want to help people, 
no matter how hard you try within the business sphere, you can only maximum, maximum, probably influence 5 million people, 2 million people. You know, he challenged me that day. I set out going to prove him wrong that we could do more than 5 million people impacted directly by business. After five or six years of pushing that, I probably had been able to impact two point something million. That's including those who have employed and all of that. Maybe we got to about two million. Now for a business, that's great. However, there was something he said. He said one policy, one policy with the right intention aimed at making a difference to people in Nigeria will impact a hundred million lives immediately. Now I started thinking about that and I said, you know, if we really want to make a difference in this country and we want to push things at a different level, then we have to be able to deal with policies, we have to deal with politics. Then he said, the only place you can do that is in government. If you are not serious about going into politics, then you are never going to impact the kind of lives that you want to impact. It was a challenge and I think that's what brought me in eventually. So coming from a family where your father was a politician, uh, was that your driving force to wanting to join politics? Because you didn't join politics until 2018. So it, it actually was the opposite. So seeing my father in politics in the mid-80s, okay, it was a time when they were driven into exile, the military pursued them. My father was one of the ones who had to leave Nigeria at that time, with, and he was friends with Abiola. His friends were killed. Uh, Delegiwa uh, was killed. Alexi Bru was killed. So he had people who were killed as a result of their influence or work within politics. I remember him running for president and my coming back to Nigeria at the time. So I came in and joined him when he was campaigning for politics. Then I saw all of these things happen. And I think my generation at that time made a decision that politics was not where we should be. And if, you, if, I, if I trace back the error of our ways was in that decision. What did we do? We all left, many of us just washed our hands off politics and went into business. And we did great in business. You can name them, anyone who set up a business around the 1990s, mid 1990s, today are great business people. Great, doesn't matter whether you think about Access Bank, you think about UBA, you think about uh, Jimovia, and so on and so forth. Dangote, many of us, at that point, what we did was just shift into business. And we created all of these entrepreneurship giants that we, that we celebrate today. But every year, we saw that politics gravely impacted what we were doing. If we were set up in any other climb as businesses, in any other climb, each of these businesses, whether it's Rwando, whether it's MRS and all of that, will be 10 times the size of where they are today. Politics hampered us greatly. And so as we entered into the uh, mid end of the 2000s and all of that, it became clear that we needed to do something different. But unfortunately, by the time we started looking at politics serious, the entire landscape has changed. Between 1999 and 2007, we lost it. But, but what's the difference between the politics of your father's time and now? So the politics of my father's time had a focus. And that focus essentially was get the military out. And so you had a lot of people rallying around a particular cause. Just let us bring democracy in and remove uh, the military. Now, a lot of the conversation around politics that I grew up under with Shewo Musa Yaradua, Giorgio Biozo, um, the former Chuba Okadibo and all, these are people who I grew listening to. Thinking back at it, they were all in their mid-30s and their singular focus back then was Nigeria. They sat down and they talked Nigeria from morning till night. How do they transit from military into democracy and drive it forward? This kind of messed with my head because it, can, it put inside of me that patriotic zeal that it had to be Nigeria, Nigeria first, Nigeria first. But somewhere along the line, because of all of these changes in military, today, good tomorrow, come back today, a lot of them got jailed, they ran away. I think they made a mistake in 1999. Uh, by then, 
abrogating politics to a class, a set of people that were not them. And that kind of just took us in, a, in another direction. But does this apply to reverse state specifically? Because uh, it, it almost seems like the, the politics in reverse states since 1999 has either been stagnant because you haven't really mentioned strong politicians from reverse state that you believe have influenced the uh, politics in reverse state. Okay. So reverse state in particular had, it, 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 was, a, it was a peculiar case. So coming into 1999, River State had been divided into Bayelsa and Rivers coming up. Prior to that, the old River State had a very strong presence of the ethnic tribe I come from, uh, the Calabaris, who seemed to be the leaders in politics, in government, and all of that. So most names you would have heard back prior to 1999 were River Rhine right names. So you would hear of Graham Douglases, you would hear of uh, Caribbean White, you would hear of the WW White names like that. Now, when we then came into that transition in 1999, those who sat back for whatever reason, so my father was one of them and all, decided that for balance and ethnic balance, let's move power from the River Rhine to the upland. So River State is now divided into, into that dichotomy of upland and River Rhine. Because we've been there for a long time, and so they sat down and somehow crafted this new river state of where power shift and transitions would happen. So give it up north, then come to the river line. So that was done in 1999. So Dili comes in and he becomes the uh, governor. But instead of that shift to come back to uh, the river line uh, community, it went, it stayed upland. So it moved from upland, minority upland, to a majority upland which then were the Aquarius that took it. And that was Rutimi Amici coming in. Then Rutimi Amici sits for eight years, and he tries at this point to correct that dichotomy by moving it to the river Rhine. And Dakuku Peter side is the one running. He's from uh, Opobu, and he's river Rhine. Wiki comes in, and there's that fight, and Wiki takes it. And so we suddenly find ourselves, for the last 20 years, in a river state that has been an upland-driven uh, politics, and the entire river Rhine community has been decimated. But has it been corrected now? Because to, uh, it's a river Rhine yeah. man so, that's in charge. Yeah. So that became that became the major argument uh, this time around. Bring it back to the river Rhine uh, community, and APC went forward with me again coming in, bringing it, and so PDP kind of did the same. Um, Opobo to an extent, is River Rhine. It's a much smaller community within the River Rhine um, uh, com complex uh, of the Jaws. But you would say, to an extent, that dichotomy has been addressed. Now, the issue is that in addressing it, it's not only about the... You would always find competent people, uh, whether they are River Rhine or Upland, so that's not where the problem is. The main problem that we see in reverse politics today is that our present governor seems to be, for lack of a better word, uh, a placeholder. Because every decision that is being taken is being taken in continuation, so to speak, of what was there before. And so the appointments continue the same. Uh, the trajectory of what type of uh, business is carried out, what government is going to do remains the same. You don't think it's too early to call? It's just a little over a month. Yeah. Okay. So it's a little over the month. Commissioners were replaced and it was almost the same commissioners that were there before. Um, an announcement was made recently that they were going to spend, I think, 200 billion or so in constructions. And what are the constructions? Bridges, roads, exactly the same thing. And so we point out some of those things that, you know, your first 100 days will tell a lot about the direction of your government. And if you're going to continue the same, we'll see it in 100 days. And so you can basically tell where it's going to go. I'm not sure that we're going to see much of a change. All right, you know, eventually we will assess uh, the same Fubara's administration. Eventually. I mean, it's fair enough. It's over a month, so we would uh, take it from where you've picked up and also look at uh, River State, gov governors in River State since 1999. But let's, co let's, let's go back to... River State politics. Now, uh, since 1999, it's been the PDP. PDP has just about won everything 
uh, from local government chairman to state assembly to the governor to national assembly. Uh, so it raises the question, what exactly is the reason why, in your opinion, the PDP has held sway? Recall that a sitting governor at the time had jumped ship to the APC, Rotomi Amechi, and still couldn't sway the, PA, the, the, the state in the direction of the APC. You know, um, there, are there are two things that I enjoy or I've come to enjoy about politics as we move along. The first aspect of it is that there's a reality of what happens on the day of election, prior to election, during election, and immediately after election. And there's a narrative that is then written after all of that. And oftentimes the narrative is so different from the reality. What's the reality of 2015? The reality of 2015 was that prior to this, there were a lot of, um, prior to 2015 coming in, a lot of militants, and there was a war against militancy. Yeah, so the amnesty program had come in, but before then, the Rotimi Amechi administration had gone very aggressive against militants and pushed a lot of them out of government. 2015 had two things that happened. The first was that the administration, weak administration coming in, then he was a candidate, had invited a lot of those militants to come back. And they came back with revenge. 2015 is recorded as the, the bloodiest period within reverse political history. Now, most people have forgotten about that, except that I get to meet almost on a daily, sorry, almost on a constant basis, people who lost their lives as a result of very targeted things. So if you said you were APC, you were meeting as APC, they would come in and they would slaughter right in front of your children and all of that, people who were meeting in APC. So it was very bloody. That was 2015. So 2015 was bad. It was very, very bad. Now, PDP, quote unquote, won the election. They went to tribunal. The tribunal first level, uh, PDP, it was then clear because all the evidence was there. So the tribunal gave uh, victory to APC. At appeal, APC. Then at Supreme Court, some magic happened. Only God knows what happened. And before you knew what happened, it had been changed. So today, 2015, we don't lament about it. It's done. But 2019 was something that I saw. Hmm, I saw this life. And I saw something that most people would have thought impossible. In 2019, we were taking off the ballot. Prior to that, we had done quite a lot of groundwork and I'd seen something then that what was termed as a grassroots dominance of PDP in River State was not existent, was non-existent. I was surprised about this, but I had made a decision to go community to community, word to word, looking for how to build grassroots support. And each place I went to, I found out that there was this lack of grassroots uh, dominance of PDP, which gave me an idea that this might mean that PDP is more about the propaganda in River State than the reality. But then we got taken out in court. However, a few days to that, APC then put their back in behind an unknown candidate, an unknown party, an unknown candidate, and just said, you know what, let's find somebody who is from the River Rhine community who we can go, and we put our entire force behind it. To the surprise and shock of everyone, that, with APC's back in there, the results started coming out, and 17 local government results were coming out. So what we did was that, looking at INEC rules, we said, you know, we're not sure that we're going to be able to get all of this if the results come into the state uh, coalition center. Because we know from experience that results are often written and not from the field. And so we decided then that announce those results, record it and upload it. Maybe that was our mistake. Because we started recording them, taking photographs and uploading. And the results started coming out. The next thing we knew, coalition was on against all sense, sensibilities. INEC postponed the election. They, uh, they didn't postpone it, they, they stopped it. They suspended collation. Collation was on. Results were already coming out. They suspended collation. As at this point, this young unknown candidate was already winning. 
but he had EPC behind him. The results were there, and that's evidence. INEX suspended collation. And for three weeks, most people forget this, for three weeks, we had no access to, now we were APC. We couldn't enter the collation center because we were APC. ZAPC is on the ballot. It was our force behind this guy, so we couldn't enter the collation center. So we stayed there and new results came out. And PDP won, 2019, that's it. So we accepted that, okay, PDP has won, but we know, and River State knows politically that these are the nuances that we see that makes us certain that if we have a free and fair election, if ever there's anything like that, and results are allowed, nothing will change, which is why you saw what happened in 2023. But, but you also said that you discovered that the APC didn't have the grassroots presence. No, PDP. The APC in River State. No, they did. APC has grassroots that, presence absolutely. in River State. You see, that was the issue. You know, there's something about fear and intimidation that gives sympathy against the, the oppressor. And this is what I found out. Now, APC, in going around, what we found was that there was a lot of sympathy. There were people who were afraid. And even in 2023, they kept saying to me, they said, you know what? We're APC. We can come out. We would like to vote. But can you guarantee our safety? That was their primary fear. I mean, Mr. Cole, you know, while you question the process, uh, in the sense 2015, give and take, uh, it, one thing is almost clear that a division within the APC, specifically in River State, has been, has been blamed as well for the woes or the struggle of the party to hold ground since 2015. Absolutely, and we can't, we can't deny that. That has been a problem. And so what you had, you know, so River's, River's politics starts from one family. And that's, the, that's what makes it so uniquely difficult to, uh, to analyze. So let's begin with the Odili family. So Odili comes in and he becomes the general of, the, or the, let's just say the godfather of reverse politics. From that one family, Amici comes out. And there's a problem between Amici and Odili by the time Amici emerges. Okay. Within that Amici, uh, Amici's emergence, you had Celestine Omeya who had come in. Celestine Omeya and Amici are cousins, but there's a division there. Now Magnus and uh, Dakuku and Ko go with Amici in this uh, fight. Magnus and Dakuku are vying to become governor. Dakuku gets it. For whatever reason, that causes another split between Dakuku, Magnus, and, uh, and Amici. They stay in the party. At this point, I'm nowhere to be seen. I'm just in the background working in politics. Dakuku and, um, and uh, Magnus are now building momentum within the party, each one having their own supporters and their own field coming through. And now this seems to be dividing EPC completely because what you have is you have Amici and his people, you have Dakuku and his people, you have Magnus and his people, and you have a PDP that looks monolithic. Now you're coming to an election, what do you do? And so it was in all of this mix that I get introduced. You know what? Why don't we come with somebody who is different, who doesn't have, who is not carrying all of this, and we'll see if we can bring all of these warring factions together. You're introduced by the leader of the party, yes. Rotimi Amici. Yes, in 20, uh, going into 2015. Now, I don't think that went down well with the parties to be. And so rather than bring everybody together, it just cracked. But who, who do you fault? You say no. it, does, it didn't go down well. And I say it is because, you know, I had a conversation with Senator Magnus Abbe. It's a good thing you mentioned him. And he largely blames um, Rotimi Amechi for the crisis within the APC in River State. Do you agree? You know, many people do. Uh, because I hear that often, Magnus has said it a lot of times, anyone who is dividing or moving on their own path, come back to that. But I cannot believe that a political party re are adults. These are people who are leaders in their own right. And there's a way you resolve problems at this level. 
And one of the ways that you resolve, you resolve problems is to come back, bring elders, bring stakeholders, and everybody speaks the truth at that point, saying, like, you know what, this is the issue. And what are we looking towards? If, and this has always been my position, if what we're looking for is in the interest of Rivers people, and we're looking to say that, you know, we have to take power away from a group that doesn't seem interested in making the welfare of Rivers people and lifting River State up economically, commercially, and all of that. If that's what we want to do, the only way we can do that is to come together. As long as we don't come together, that's a problem. Who's supposed to lead this? That's what I was trying to do. Because I found you that... Was, you were introduced. Yeah, I was you, introduced. You don't think that the leader of the party should have taken charge? But again, I, like I said, we're adults. Now, between them, there's a lot of deep animosity. Very deep. The more I, the more I study, the more I find out that uh, there's more to me to all of this than meets the eye. And so you find very deep-seated emotions at play right now. But we must find a way to resolve that. So here's what Senator Magnus Abe said to me that could be responsible for this. It's the high-handedness, as he put it, of the leader of the party who's chosen to instead talk to them, push forward a candidate, which turned out to be you. So in his words, if the leader of the party had sat with them, to share ideas and explain, sort of make them feel like they're part of the family. Because according to him, they're contemporaries. He doesn't see Senator uh, Mr. Rotimi Amechi just as a leader. He sees him as a contemporary because according to him, they, had, they fought for his uh, seat when he went into exile. So he expected uh, Rotimi Amechi to take charge, but that didn't happen. Instead, he imposed you on the part. You know, and so when it comes, this I heard a lot about imposition, and I feel that that was too strong a term, and I think it was very political a term in 2015. It became an excuse for why the crack uh, would be there, and I don't think there was an imposition, because at the end of the day, each party, these are all party uh, people, and they all, the most, or certain groups, must agree before somebody comes in. I don't think there's any one person that has the ability to impose anybody, first and foremost. What my understanding was in coming, and part of the reason why I felt that uh, it was important to do this, was that I believed 100% that, you know what, the, the warring factions are so entrenched that you need to bring a different viewpoint into the game. And hopefully, if they begin to see that viewpoint, they will, they will move forward. What I underestimated completely was the, that when somebody believes that they've seen their route to power, it's very difficult to move them away from it. And I think I saw that dynamics that, why you? Why must it be you and all? We, we've come a long way since then. This last election was very different. One of the things that happened this time around was from the lessons learned then. Ruti Mamichi said, you know what, last time everybody blamed me and said that you were imposed and all of that. This time, go, everybody, go and find your way. Discuss with people, come to an agreement, do whatever you like. I am not going to get involved. And to a large extent, and I say large extent, he did not get involved. And everybody went after this position. Everybody from Tony Prince Will to uh, Dakuku, Magnus Abe, everybody went, Dawari George and all. We each campaigned among stakeholders. We went door to door amongst the principal decision makers, trying to convince each one that for the good of the party, for the good of the state, this individual is the one there. It was a very tough fight. Very, very tough this time around. Okay, let's go to the elections now, specifically in your state. You, in 2019, you didn't make it to the ballot because of the court order. But in 2023, you did. But you still question the process. Let me just begin by asking you what's your update from the tribunal because you've insisted on going ahead with it. Yes, I have. Yeah, I don't like <laughs> I love that. I insist. Yes, I did insist that we must go ahead because, you know, again, what you see on election day, 
everybody saw. I mean, this was something that was captured live. People saw River State live. You have an EU report that has River State right in the middle and center of problems. You have a BBC report that has River State in the middle of problems. So everybody covered it. Channels was there. People, you were there. So we saw what happened. Now, the interesting thing about politics is that all of that story, you now have to translate it to facts and figures in writing, witnesses that must capture all of these things in small paragraphs. And, and that's where the challenge is. So that must happen. And then the tribunal, who may or may not have seen it, may or may not have been there, all that doesn't matter to them. Bring the facts forward. Show that these things actually happen and that they were against the electoral law. And that's what we're doing. So how has that affected your relationship with the party? Because your party has uh, chosen not to be a part of it. Mm, okay. So I love the word party because party always seems to be everybody in a party has decided that this is how they're going. It's not everybody that ever agrees on these things. And that's the beauty about politics. As many people as are willing to go one way for any political exigencies, you have others that are standing with you. And so the party... Right. I have enough members of the party who are saying, just stay where you are. Keep going. Don't worry about what we see on the outside. That's politics. Okay. There were some deals that happened. And APC pulling out as a party from the uh, tribunal was, let's just call it part of a deal that happened. And it's fine. Do you, do you have the support of the leader of the party, Roti Mamechi, to proceed with the suit? Of course. Very well. But, but the question now is, despite the fact that you questioned the processes, you had also talked about the reports that had come out from that election. Do you believe that you did win that election, or do you just believe that the process was flawed? Okay. So, when, when we talk about the process, I loved certain things about this election, and I want to make sure that Nigerians understand this so that they don't give up on the process. I don't have a problem with the process of the election in its way. I have, a pro I have a problem with the hijack of the process, but not the process. And let me explain. One of the most brilliant innovations that came into the 2023 election was the Beavers. From a Rivers perspective, where I have seen and I've had in 2019, for example, I had to physically escort INEC officials that were trapped in the collision center, they could not release one material because of gunshots and just they were kept down. They couldn't move. No election happened on that day because they just ambushed that center and they couldn't move. From a place where I've seen youth coppers shaking and hiding under tables for fear of their lives and not going anywhere, to a point where on the election day, we saw them in their uniform, carrying their materials, and walking on their own, going into boats, and going to places that normally in river state elections you don't go. Because you've been on the boat, and they will hijack you there and then, and tell you that you're either going into the water or you give them the result sheets there and then. All of these things are typical rivers election strategy, except this time around, because there was a belief that the beavers would work, people be behaved. And so the election process in itself was working. Voting went very smoothly for the first three or four hours. And then, all of a sudden, it was, uh, we were watching it happen, and I was like, what the, what, what's going on? You started hearing reports from the situation room where they were calling and saying that so -so -so place has been hijacked. Uh, somebody has come in, policemen have come in, and they've escorted the local government chairman, or they've escorted this person here, and they've hijacked this. At first, we thought it was a joke, you know. I was like, you know, it can't, it can't happen. All of these things would be corrected because where are they taking it to? Where are they carrying the machines to? It won't work here. Unfortunately, not only did it work, those results were accepted, and this is where we are today. So the process in itself, beavers worked until when they started uploading it. So 
They call it a glitch. That glitch, resolve it. If you resolve that glitch, you won't have a problem. So, so I take it that you question the credibility of the process, but you believe that you would have won that election. Ah, okay. So, sorry. So we're getting there. Yes. So, the intimidation then begin, began to happen, where people who were coming out to vote were now told that if they come out to vote, they will flog them, they will kill them. So we saw a lot of things. Bottom line of this was that the election itself and the, the, the outcome of that election became very, very questionable. Would I have won this election without any of that drama going on? That's a clarity. Everybody knows. Can we today now say we won or we didn't win? Because the, the uh, results were so manipulated, so cancelled, so changed, it's difficult to say. So what are your prayers at the tribunal? Both. So the first aspect of it is that the tribunal, taking a look at that entire election, should cancel the elections and have a run of the election, that's one. But if in the process of now recalculating and looking at all that, uh, that is done, removing certain places that are clearly fraudulent, and I believe that will win, then we'll be declared the winner. Are you, are you, are you satisfied or happy for the fact that the APC won the presidential election in River State. Yes, and that's, that has been a center of uh, discourse in the last couple of years. Now remember that I said from 2015 to 2023, one of the things that we have seen at the grassroots was that we have had to penetrate and see a very solid APC presence in the grassroots. I remember seeing a president and saying to him that, sir, APC, there, there's something about propaganda, you know, you come on TV every day and just talk about PDP and use results to say PDP has won everything and all. There's something about that and there's another thing about the reality on the ground. What I can assure you, reality on the ground is that APC would win. So, so you are saying that the presidential election in River State was fair, but the governorship election was not. Okay. So presidential election was the first one to come through. As at the presidential election, when it was running through, APC was already winning that. Because remember I said there was, no viol there was hardly any violence at that point. It was totally unnecessary what happened in River State. By, uh, by the PDP at that point, now hijacking results that were already coming out, the results were already going for APC, then you hijack those results and begin to change it, especially in the area of uh, Obiapo and, and, and Falga. But generally, APC was doing well, and I believe 100%, 100% that APC would have won that election. We've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of no, groundwork. Mr. Cole, the question is, you believe that the presidential election in River State was fair, but the governorship election was not. Mm. So, two things. I said the voting had already begun. And when that voting was going on, there was no violence, there was no hijack, nothing. The voting finished. It was at collision just when they for started. For the governorship election? No, for the, for the presidential election. For the presidential. And that changed the dynamics. Because what then happened was that people now saw and said that, okay, so if this can be hijacked and this is what's going to happen, then everything that you had prevented from happening at the governorship now came into play. Well, you know that for this presidential election, which you talk about, the claim is that the Labour Party was winning the election, which was swayed in the direction of the APC. Hmm. So that's the claim. I think that's what uh, that's, that's that, what I did. That's, that's exactly. Good. Now, within the area that I witness, within Akokotori where I come from, and the Calabari regions where I come from, there was none of those things there. What we saw with APC, uh, Labour, PDP, was within Obiapo, where the governor comes from, and uh, Falga, which is within the Ikweri uh, region. These are heavy Igbo areas where Igbo presence is a lot. And so those votes were split, APC, PDP, Labour. To what dimension and what category, I don't know. However, what you saw were manipulations in that area, which is why you have the tribunal. How it's going to go, where it's going to go, I cannot speak, for, speak to that. But I do know that had they not begun that issue of hijacking on that day, 
would have had it totally. We wouldn't have what we have uh, today where River State is now in the front and center of all the problems that we see. I believe that the president would have won. But, but who takes credit for the victory of the AEPC at the presidential election? Because the River State Governor does. Yeah, he, that, the, the River State Governor is... Uh, former River State Governor, I beg former, your pardon. He's very... What's the, what's the best word? He's very loud. Okay? He's very loud. And uh, by nature of being loud, he shouts the most, speaks the most, he's out there the most, and he will claim the most. You don't win something in a day. You might write and hijack a result in a day, but you do not win in a day. It takes time. And I keep saying that we had built a formidable presence in River State, which is why they had to resort to what they did to prevent us from going. Had they not resorted to all the hijacks and violence and all of that, you would see a totally different thing. And I believe 100% that what you saw there was that if we allowed things to go, very pursue no hijack, nothing, then we will not be able to claim that we won this election. The only way they can claim is because they did what they did. And having done what they did, they can come out and say that, oh, we're not winning, and we had to do this, that's why we're winning. So you're saying that the APC was leading I the believe, in the presidential election in River State, me, I believe, and then the River, the River State governor still altered it in, the, in yes. favor of the APC. Now, this is what I believe. I believe that it would have been a very close election. Because it was. There was a lot of dis discussions. I believe that the River State would have ultimately gone to the APC. It would have been very close. It would have been very close. Well, well you know, uh, as loud as you say is, he's got the attention of the president. And as it stands now, uh, there seems to be some form of alliance between him and the president. Does that give you concern as a party member in River State? No. Okay. So, first of all, you remember I said, I understand the politics, okay? Now, when you look, if you are not from River State and you are not in River State and you are not on the ground in River State, what you see and what you hear is what comes out by the media. And by virtue of, if you remember that period, one of the things that my ex-governor is extremely good at, and you have to give this to him, is that he knows how to orchestrate scenarios. And so what he did was he dominated the airspace for months, weeks, he stopped us from putting up banners everywhere you went. They created all sorts of hurdles that we had to go past. And so what happened was that the entire airspace was dominated for a long time by him, which gives the impression to somebody who is staying on the outside, if you're in Abuja or Lagos and all of that, that you know what, the only people that are there is PDP. Now, in a political negotiation that you are then thinking about doing it. You're hearing me say to you that, look, leave all of this as propaganda. The real thing on the ground, what we're seeing is that... You know, you know you're know, <laughs> alleging that he has deceived the president. I know he deceived the president. It's not an alleged... It's not a legend. I know exactly what happened in River State, and River State politics will tell you the same. Look, there's a different issue. You know, they would always come and say, these are the results, okay? APC, uh, PDP has won all the seats. PDP has always been there. It's only PDP. It's a PDP government, and that's fine. So, uh, former governor, Nelson Wicked did not win the River State election. He for knows. He knows it. Yeah, he, they, they know. He knew. You see. But but, but 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 how does it bother? Does it not bother you that, with regard to ministerial slots per state, that his name is mentioned as an opposition member? Uh, in the same vein as party faithful like you and Senator Abe. Um, so let me put it this way, two things. The first is that it's a prerogative of the president to decide who and what type of scenario he wants to build. He may choose as a president that, you know what, let me create a, a government that seems to be, that is a unity government, so bring people from different parties and all that. That may be one of the considerations. It may be that uh, this perception that he delivered that I must reward him. I went into a deal, I must reward him. It might be the case. Now, whatever the president's rationale behind that is, it's not question. I won't question that. He's the president. But it would, you wouldn't be disturbed no, that no, as no, a no. party member, an opposition member is being given a slot no. that ordinarily you should feel. No. So that is part of what I have come to learn about politics. So what we will do instead is ensure that whatever happens, He's not going to take APC in River State. APC in River State is going nowhere. The president has 
a choice. The choice is that he has a party in River State. That party in River State, of which I lead the party in River State, has been formidable, has been through a lot, has spent a lot of money to get to where it is. It has built APC. You know, River's APC members are some of the most die-hard members, political members that I've seen. Over the last eight years, they've been harassed, locked up, and all of that, yet they stand. You know, for the president, that group of people, that group of people, they always need to remember them. They need to remember that there are people who will carry APC on their, if they could tattoo themselves APC, they will tattoo themselves APC, they will stay with APC and fight for APC. So, so how, do, do how does the president that. accommodate the APC in River I'm sure, State? I'm sure he, the president's an old fox in politics. I'm, oh, I'm certain 100% that he has a plan up his sleeve. Would, would you welcome former Governor Newsom Wicker to the APC, considering I don't, I don't what that think would mean? Would you welcome him? Let's see what happens. But I don't think he's coming. Well, if he does come, would you welcome him? Then he's part him? of the family. If he comes, he comes. Then we'll have to find another way of living together. But for now, I don't think he's coming. I, I suspect that uh, this is all part of a politics towards what happens in 2027, what happens in 2031. I have no doubt that uh, Governor Yeson Wiki is, has deep interest in politics moving forward in terms of presidency or vice presidency or something. So all of this is all part of his own calculation as to where he's going and what he wants to do. I think for us in opposition, so to speak, our responsibility at the end of the day is to hold them to account, to bring out to the reality, as we're doing today, some of the things that have happened, and allow the powers to be who see a lot more to make their decisions. And whatever political decision is made, we accept it and we move on. So let's quickly look at governance in River State since 1999. As we already established, it's been the PDP at the saddle, in the saddle in the past 24 years. How would you say that River State has evolved in terms of development in the last 24 yeah, years that's under such a, one that's, single party? That's such a great question. And I think the best thing, if you look at things in isolation, then you don't have a good comparison. And so what you often have to do is compare it with something that everybody can look at. And I will always compare River State with Lagos State because I know as a young uh, school leaver, university, while I was still in university and all of that, that one of the go-to places for anybody who was in school and looking when they graduate, where do I want to be posted to, where do I want to go to, and all of that was River State. Business-wise, River State and Lagos State were at par. Now I'm talking about mid 1990s, okay? So 19, from all the way up until the uh, early 2000s, River State and Lagos were like this. All right. So Lagos State has been on the same party with the same party for the last 20 years. Okay. River State has been with the same party for the last 20 years. Now please start looking at all the indices. Look at the economic indices, look at the uh, uh, human development indices, just look at all the indices, and this is what you will see. You will see River State has been doing this, and you will see Lagos State has been doing this. They are so far apart economically, commercially, way to live, interests of where to go to, security so far apart, that it tells you that there has been a problem in the last 20 years in River State politics. Something is wrong, and something has to be done. We need to change that dynamics and bring River State back to where it used to compete or even became, for many people, a place of preference. I know people from all over Nigeria, just as they do in Lagos, who used to go to River State. They will be posted. They will come from the north. They will be posted to River State. They will buy houses in River State. They will build houses in River State. They will remain in River State. Today, nobody wants to stay. It's a problem. But how about infrastructure development? It okay. would seem that in the past eight years, uh, it's been the focus of the weak It was the focus of the weak administration. And then you look at the same Fubara, just as you rightly pointed Continue out, 200. Is there something wrong with that? No, no, absolutely nothing wrong with infrastructure until you start looking at some of the details again. And so some of the details you would have, for example, the major infrastructure bridges, right? So we had a lot of bridges. This, 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 that's the trademark of River State government, they'll talk about the bridges. There are other roads that they built into other communities, but bridges, that's the main trademark of bridges. Twelve major bridges 
tough flyovers that supposedly change the infrastructure uh, dynamics of River State. Ten of them are in one local government. And you know, when, when you start seeing those things, you, you begin to understand the games that are being played. Port Harcourt local government? Yes, between Port Harcourt and Obiakwa. Majorly because it's the capital? No. Majorly because, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I mean, so whatever the case, you have to in three local governments. Now, of more importance or more, let's just say, something a bit more finer in details that most people would miss, is that the entire River Rhine communities that are made up of various islands and communities that are cut away from, uh, from infrastructure by virtue of rivers and all of that, in this period, this is what you have in those places. One, the number one problem is that every single one of, most of, no, let me not say every single one, most of the youths in that area today belong to a cult group. Two, teenage pregnancies are beyond anything that you believe. By the age of 30 and all of that, you would have young girls that already have five, six children from different men. No job prospects, bunkering or illegal crude, uh, it's in, that's a major economy there. Ecological disasters, education, non-existent. There are many places within all of these areas where you have no government presence. When I mean no government presence, basic things, no magistrate court, no primary or secondary health centers. Guess what? No police station. None, not a single police station and all. So you are finding people who are governed by their own laws, by their own rules within River State. And we have infrastructure development. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. You know, uh, not many people know this, but I was born and raised in Port Harcourt. You were. I lived in Port Harcourt for 27 years. And sometime last year, I thought it wise to go see what's happening there. I saw the roads, as you mentioned, but one thing I observed was that there was uh, a lack in human capital development. The standard of the living of the people had not changed much and had been away for almost 10 years. And then he raised the question, you look at uh, states like Lagos and the federal capital territory, and then you, you, you see the level of investment. While I was in Port Harcourt, I saw big companies fold up so going back to Port Harcourt, I sought to know what new companies had come up. Where do you fault this lack of human capital development, investment, and perhaps improvement in the standard of living of the people? And because we're round enough, perhaps you could tell us what you would have done differently if you were governor. Okay, so Terry, and, and I'm glad that you went back and you saw one of the indices that you can tell about an economy of a place is screens, construction. So if you look in the skyline and you see cranes happening, especially where you, you have a constraint with land and you see cranes, then you know that the economy is booming, okay? Because cranes translate to wealth, personal wealth or other wealth that is now being invested in a place. You can go around River State and count the number of cranes that you will see in one hand. Come into Abuja and take a look and you see estates being built over and over. Go to Lagos, the same thing. And it tells you that where money goes. Money is like water. It will find its level. It will find its level. It will go where it's welcome. It's not welcome in River State. It's not welcome in River State. And that's a problem. So people take their money and they leave. Take their money and they leave. So this Because? Three things. So the first aspect of it had to do with violence for a long time, security, just that whole perception that it wasn't secure for a long time. The second aspect of it was that it was just an unfriendly place in terms of law and order. Any kind of investment, if the state, the state government was just business unfriendly. And so where you feel that there's an impunity and a government can create any kind of law anytime and do whatever you like, so whether you're arresting uh, Ajip uh, MDs or oil and gas MDs, you're stopping it, you know, there are certain things that we are done. Each of those things gives a signal that this is not a safe place for me to do business. So you just keep your skeletal business and you go. So executive orders were, were brought up and all of that. I have investments in real estate that were stalled for the last eight years, couldn't move. 
Why? Because I came into politics. And so you see, so when you see those things, somebody comes in and drives by and sees these major investments that should have been, and instead sees a hole in the ground and sees nothing. For any other business person, they will stop. They will say, you know what, this is not a good place for me to bring my money. Also, when you come in as an investor and you fly into Port Harcourt Airport, it's gone down a bit, but it's still that. You fly to Port Harcourt Airport and you come out, the first thing you see waiting for you are armored vehicles, almost bulletproof cars all over, military vehicles, soldiers, Air Force, uh, Navy, all of them with gun totting machine guns on, on, on vehicles, bulletproof clad policemen, escorts all over the place. There are more policemen when you come out of Port Harcourt Airport than anywhere else. What does that tell you as an investor? That this is not a safe place. When you have to go and the first thing you must think about is getting into a bulletproof vehicle, it's a problem. So all of these things lead to lack of investment and we must change it. So what was I going to do differently? The first aspect of it is that everybody knows that one of the things that my greatest skill lies in, first and foremost, is in the entrepreneurial space. How do you attract business? What kind of business and what kind of comfort would you give to anybody if I were sitting on that side of the table and I was coming to a state for the first time and I was seeing the governor for the first time, what would I want to hear? I know what I would want to hear. So it's easy for me to say to them, this and this and this are the guarantees that we can give. This is what we're going to do. This is why your money will come in. And so... So, That's where we are. Uh, Mr. Tony Cole, I've enjoyed the conversation. I'd like to thank you for coming on Political Paradigm. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. Well, I've been speaking with uh, Mr. Tony Cole. He is a former APC governorship candidate in River States. Thank you very much for your time as well. I'd like to urge you to go to YouTube or ChannelsTV.com to search for this episode and others. I'm Terry Ikumi. Goodbye.